Hello. Yeah. And uh, welcome to this installment of the presentations I, hear, I do here at the uh, Holliston Senior Center. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an elder law attorney. I do nothing but elder law, and I can do that because I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us. We're a multi-specialty firm. There are about 40 in Worcester, 20 in uh, Westboro, where I spend most of my time, 10 in Boston. We're the biggest law firm now outside of the city of Boston. But because we're multi-specialty, everybody gets to really focus on what they like, and I like this. Uh, I like it because most of my clients still think I'm young, which is terrific, right? So um, I'm doing two presentations this spring. Um, I just did one about a month ago, and it was called Elder Law for Couples. And now I'm talking about Elder Law for Singles because it really, there are several things that <clears throat> change once you're single. Um, well, you probably know that if you're single. <laughs> but, but the point is there are some options that, you, that were available to you when you were married regarding some of this planning that are no longer available. So you have to kind of be thinking about doing things a little bit differently. So uh, this presentation, uh, you've probably seen me, if you've seen me before, talk about my friends uh, Frank and Mary. And I always talk about them and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, I, and, and their basic estate plan was, and one died, everything went to the other. Following the death of the second one, everything went to their kids. And now one has died because Mary's still around, but Frank, well, she thinks he went to heaven. You never know. But the point is, he's not around. And so she's trying to figure out now what she needs to be doing. And so I'm going to talk about what she needs to be doing at two different points in her life. First, when she's a little bit younger and she's only about 70, uh, and then uh, or 65 or 70, and then, and then again when she's 85 because her concerns change as she gets older. There are slight, some slightly different concerns that she, uh, as she gets older. So um, when she's 65, she's trying to figure out, okay, she wants to leave her things to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And you know, some have got kids and some don't, and some are working and some aren't, and there's some family issues. There's a ton of different possible issues that she needs to talk about. Here are the things she needs to be discussing, though. She has to deal with short-term disability. What happens if I get sick? I go to the hospital. I have a minor heart thing, whatever. What happens? Who's, who's there watching out for things if I can't for a while? Um, second, if I die, are, I'm, have I made sure that things are going to get divided up the way I want them to be divided up? Um, third, can I do that while avoiding probate? Because I hate to waste the time and energy of have my kids waste the time and energy of, and pay the lawyers regarding probate. And then fourth, if there's an estate tax issue, how do I get rid of it? And, by, and for a lot of folks now, there is an estate tax issue just because if you own a house, houses have gone up so much. So if you have a house plus a 401k, some other thing, next thing you know, you're not at like $5 million, but you're over a million, which means there's an estate tax issue that you want to pay attention to. So we're going to talk about all of those things to start off. We're going to assume Mary is 65. She's got a house worth about $350,000. She has savings, two fifty, dollars an IRA or 401k that's worth about three hundred. dollars um, She's got an annuity. She's named her kids as the death beneficiaries. That's worth about two hundred. dollars She's got total assets of a million one. Her income from Social Security is about $2,000 a month. Of course, she's earning a little bit more from the savings and the IRA and all that other jazz. So that's her basic situation. So regarding... The two things she has to have, and, I'm, and you've heard me talk about this before, it, it are real, are they're really important, is she has to take care of this possibility of short-term disability. You all, you, we, people say you always have to take care of this because it could happen any time. Yeah, that's true. But the older you get, the more likely it, would, hood, the more likely it is it really is going to happen, that you're going to have some kind of short-term medical problem. So you have to have a health care proxy. To do that, you have to make sure you've signed a proxy, two witnesses, the only rule is the witness, no witness can be one of the people you've named in your proxy. Doesn't need to be notarized. Doesn't need your doctor's assent. Uh, it only becomes effective when your doctor says that you can't make a medical decision. So you're not losing any power by signing this document uh, at the time that you sign it. You can only have one agent at a time here in Massachusetts. So if, if Mary can't name all of her kids jointly to be her proxy, only, I'm going to take all questions at the end. Uh, the reason is if I'm the doctor, and Mary's sick, I don't want to be hearing two kids argue about what I have to do. I only want to talk to one person, and that person can deal with the others, right? So one person at a time. And every time you sign a proxy, uh, you've automatically revoked all of your old ones. 
So the latest proxy is the correct proxy. So how many of you here have a proxy? Raise your hand. That's good. How many of you, if I asked you, could find that proxy in two minutes? Oh, that's really good. Most people, they're like, now where did I put that again? Right? So the next question, once you have the proxy is, um, um, first of all, have you told your agent? How many people here have told their agent that they're the proxy? Raise your hand. Oh, not everybody. So I, so I was talking to this doctor. This is down at, I do work in Nantucket in the vineyard. I was talking to the doctor who was in charge of kind of the intake. Not the doctor, he's a social worker. And I said, so just as a curiosity, do you often have people that you call because someone's come in and, and they're named as the proxy and, the, and they don't know they're the proxy? And he said, oh yeah, about 20% of the time. Right? We'll call somebody, oh, you know, your mother's in the hospital and you're named as the proxy, and they'll say, I am? Well, that's not good. That's not good, right? You need to talk to the proxy to make sure that the proxy knows that they're the ones and to see if they're okay with that, right? Um, you probably want to have a broader conversation with that proxy at that point about kind of how you want to be treated because at that point, and we're going to talk about this a little more later on, you're thinking this is just a short-term thing and we're just making sure, you know, if I had an emergency, I'm in the hospital, I'm going to be home soon. But you don't know that at our age, right? You can have a stroke and next thing you know, you're out for a long time and your proxy is making all these decisions and it isn't like a very specific decision, like, you know, do not resuscitate, you know. It's this whole set of decisions that can have to be made over a long time. So you want your proxy, if you've named them, first of all, to be the person that you trust to make those decisions over a long time because they're going to think about what you want, not what they want. But second, you've got to tell them what you want. And I'll give you the classic example. So you, ha you have a stroke, right? And it's a bad stroke. And so you're really incapacitated. Um, and, uh, and, and now you're stuck either at home or in bed in a nursing home or whatever. You're stuck. And now you're living along, right? And you get pneumonia. And so the question is, do you want to go to the hospital? Because, of course, if you go to the hospital, they'll cure the pneumonia. But then, of course, when you come back, you're where you were, right? So the question is, do you really want to go to the hospital, right? Or do you want to die where you are? And once you've answered that question, then say to yourself, I really want my proxy to know that. I want my proxy, if that's the person who's making the decision at that point, because that's a medical decision, whether to go to the hospital, um, to know that. So you have to have that conversation. So you, you want to make sure you've talked to your agent. Um, where should the proxy be in addition to your knowing where it is? Give it to your doctor. Give a copy to your doctor. Have them scan it into your record. That way, if there is an emergency and you're, you're heading to the hospital in the ambulance and, and nobody's got your proxy, because that was the last thing they were thinking about, you know, the EMT or whatever, right? That, that at the hospital, they can call your doctor and your doctor can just scan it and send it to them. The doctor is actually required um, to, uh, to, to, if you give them your proxy, to put it into your medical record. It's part of the state law, right? Um, the hospital. Should it be at the hospital? Remember, you've probably signed proxies, right? If you've ever gone to the hospital and they said, well, you know, you've got to sign this before we'll admit you or before we'll really look at you. If you did that, um, <clears throat> when you left the hospital, they probably threw it away. So don't count on the fact that the hospital has it. Best place is to have your doctor have it. Power of attorney. Raise your hand if you have a power of attorney. Oh, not quite as good, but pretty good. That's great. That's great. Have to have it. You know, the power, when you sign the power of attorney, you're not giving away any power to anybody. What you're saying is that there's somebody else besides you who can also act on your behalf to make legal decisions for you, like go to the bank, call the insurance company, call the city, complain about your taxes, a whole bunch of things. You all have to have a power of attorney. Power of attorney does not have to be witnessed uh, as long as you don't own any property that's in a state in which it would have to be witnessed. I, I'll give you, for, for example, New Hampshire and, and uh, Florida. If you have real estate there, even if you're doing a Massachusetts um, power of attorney, you should make sure you have the witnesses so that it would be valid in terms of dealing with your other property. Uh, it doesn't have to be notarized unless you have real estate and you want your attorney to be able to sign deeds and other things for you that get recorded in the registry of deeds. It always we always recommend it though, and the reason is because the person who is deciding whether your power of attorney is valid is not a lawyer or a doctor or a lawyer or a, or a, or a judge. 
But it's like the guy at the bank. When your son goes in with the power of attorney to draw money out of your account and the, and the, and the, and the buy, guy at the bank's going, nah, this really looks old. Or, wow, you know, I don't know. It, there's like a magic about having a notary seal on one of these. Does not make it valid. You don't need a notary seal, but it makes people think it's valid. And that's the reason why you get the notarization. Um, in your power of attorney, as opposed to your proxy, you can name more than one person at the same time. So you can name a couple of your kids jointly and severally, which means either one of them, or if there are three of them, any one of them can act on your behalf if the others aren't around, right? Or, or if you don't trust them, you can name them jointly. So they all have to sign, right? The point is, you, you know, you, you, you don't have to just name one and then another as a backup. Uh, and finally, a new one does not invalidate an old one. You can have multiple powers of attorney that are valid at the same time. You can name, have one power of attorney that names several kids, or you can have three powers of attorney, one naming each of the kids, and hand those out, and they're all valid. Uh, and, you can re and you can do a new power of attorney, and that's okay, but signing the new one doesn't revoke any of the old ones. So kind of note to file, if, you've got, if you're in that situation and you're, and you're saying, well, oh, I really don't really like this person anymore, I'm not kind of trusting that he's really gonna take care of my stuff, so I'm gonna name somebody else in my power of attorney. Uh, at that point, you probably want to go to your bank or other financial institution and tell them that and notify the first person that you revoked his power of attorney and give the bank something in writing that says that you revoked it. The reason for that is that if that guy that you were trying to get rid of goes to the bank and, and shows them your power of attorney and gives them an affidavit, a sworn statement that says that the power of attorney hasn't been revoked and that you're not dead, the bank can give them all your money, and the bank's not liable. The reason for that is there's a provision, I bet you, in your power of attorney that says just that, that says if the attorney presents a, 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 some certificate saying that the power of attorney hasn't been revoked and that you're not dead, that the person dealing with him is not liable. The reason for, the, for that is to make sure the power of attorney works so that if, I, if I'm your attorney and I go to the bank to withdraw money on your behalf, the bank doesn't say, well, prove to me that the power of attorney hasn't been revoked. Well, how do I prove a negative? How do I prove that? I can't. So, that, so that's the reason why you put that provision in. But that's why you'd want to notify people, okay? Uh, provisions that you want, if you have a power of attorney, which most of you do, make sure, if you have real estate, and you want your attorney to deal in that real estate, that you've said that right in the power of attorney. Otherwise, they can't. Make sure, if you're a senior, and you want to really give this attorney the option to deal on your behalf, especially if there are any mass health issues involved so that they need to rearrange your assets, to make gifts. Uh, many powers of attorney don't do that. Uh, I have a lady I talked to earlier this week in, in um, where? Lancaster. Her husband is now not doing well. He's got a disease that causes dementia. And so we need to be rearranging some assets for mass health purposes. And among other things, she needs to be shifting some of the assets that are in his name to just her and signing a deed, deeding the property to herself um, so that he can then qualify for mass health. But the power of attorney says that any gifting in which she is named as the attorney says that any gifting can be only done to their kids, right? So we can't do this. So I can't qualify this guy for mass health unless I get a conservatorship and then as the conservator, revoke that power of attorney and do a new one. This is a problem, right? Um, the power of attorney does say that the children can get things, but it caps the amount they can get at the, at the so-called the federal, the federal uh, gift tax deduction amount. And I bet if I say those words, you probably think the number $15,000. I'm going to talk to you about the fact that that as a, as a tax issue is irrelevant, but the point is that cap is often in there which means in this particular case that, that this lady on behalf of her husband also can't make gifts to the kids. Um, that's a real, that can be a real problem. So you wanna make sure that gifting is in there and that there are no caps. Um, getting the estate plan right. So we've dealt with the power of attorney and the healthcare proxy. So now she, Mary just wants to make sure that the right people get the assets. So to begin with, remember she said, that when she dies, she simply wants the assets to be divided equally among the three kids. That is exactly what would happen if she died without a will. 
leaving her assets and going to go through her estate. That's exactly what would happen. Um, first, what would happen is the assets would need to go through the probate process, though, right? And that happens whether she has a will or not. If she dies owning assets that have to go through probate, um, that means they're assets where she hasn't specified who gets them when she dies, like in the deed or right in the bank account or whatever. If she dies owning her home in just her name, it has to go through probate. And if it goes through probate, um, it, there are some things that are going to happen, but the point is that at the end of the day, the property is going to get divided equally among the three kids. So if that's all she wants, she doesn't even need a will. That's why I mention it. People will often come in saying, oh, I really need a will. But, she, but also, having a will doesn't avoid probate. So the question is, is that really what she wants? And the way that she should figure that out is by asking, does any of my kids have a creditor problem? Because I don't want to leave this money inadvertently to the creditors or like to the IRS if my child has an IRS problem, right? Does my child have a marriage problem? Because if I leave it all to, the, to my son and, and you know, that, that daughter-in-law I never liked in the first place then files for divorce, the money's going to get divided up, right? Or is there a disability issue? Does one of my kids now or might they in the future need to qualify for mass health or get a Section 8 for housing or qualify for SSI? all programs that are means tested so that they can't have more than a given amount of assets. Because in that case, if I give them something, that's going to automatically exclude them from those programs. So in any of those cases, what, what Mary would probably want to do is say regarding that chunk of money that would have gone to that child, that she'd want to have that money held in trust for the benefit of that child. She can say that right in the will. She would probably name one of her other kids as the trustee. But in that situation, as long as the child she is trying to protect does not have the right to order the distribution to himself or herself, a creditors can't force that issue. It, the money's not included in any divorce, um, and, the, and, it, and that money does not disqualify that child from receiving any kind of government benefits. Finally, there's the issue of the grandchildren. Uh, often, Mary will say, well, you know, I really want to have some money put aside to make sure the, for the grandchildren's college education which sounds great. I will just mention to you that if you do that, what you think you are giving to the grandchild, you may really kind of inadvertently be giving like to Harvard because if he applies to Harvard, <clears throat> he's going to have to file this FAFSA form, this federal form relating to his assets and his parents um, or whatever their comparable form is. And based on my experience, if he shows that he has assets or even assets that are in trust for him, even if the money can't be paid to him until after he's age 22, this was how people would try to play this game, um, the, the Harvard will subtract from his student aid dollar for dollar for that money. Because the Harvard legitimately will say, look, we've got a, a, a limited pile of money. Well, not Harvard, but some, most schools have a, a, a limited pile of money. We're not going to give it to people who can otherwise pay. And if the money's right there for college, they can pay, right? So that may not be a good idea. What you may really want to be doing is giving the money to your kids. This assumes that you trust your kids. Um, and telling them, you know, we really want some of this to be left aside for the college, okay? Um, every family is different. We already talked about that. Other issues, if you're doing that will, um, you want to make sure, you're, in the will, you're going to name somebody who's going to run things. You want to make sure you pick the right kid who's going to run that, the one you trust the most. There's typically one of those, right? Uh, if there are two children, you want to make sure that there's a tiebreaker in the event that there's a disagreement between the two children. That is the most common job that lawyers do. I never encourage clients to name the lawyer as the personal representative or as the trustee of a trust because we cost a lot. So it's, and we don't know your family. The best personal representative or trustee is someone you know and someone you can trust. And then that person, if they need a lawyer, can then hire a lawyer. Or if they need an accountant, can hire an accountant. The only time we are useful, I think, as a, in, in this kind of role is if there's a dysfunctional family. And you know they're all going to argue. And so you, you sit, make the lawyer the manager, right? But if there are two people, oftentimes we'll be named as the tiebreaker. I've been I think I've mentioned this here before. I've been named as the tiebreaker. I'm pretty old, so maybe like a thousand times. Um, I've never been asked to break a tie. As soon as people know they have to pay the tiebreaker, they figure it out, 100% of the time. So you, you just want to figure that out. Finally, if there is a house, as there is in this case, 
if there's anything special about the house, like you want one of your kids to have us, you know, a, an option to buy it because, or any of your kids, you want to be really clear on how that gets priced. Um, you don't want to start getting involved in appraisals and stuff because then everybody fights about them. Pick a number. Probably the best number that I recommend is the assessed value of the property at the time you die. That may end up being lower than what the actual value is, but everybody knows what it is. It's easy to find, right? And then if you want to give your kids, if, there's a, if you have a special interest in keeping the house in the family or in giving a particular child a benefit, then you simply say, whatever that number is, that child is going to be able to buy it at a discount. 10% off that number, 20% off that number, how, however you want to work it, right? If there's an occupancy issue, oh, you know, I had one son that really took care of us and I want to make sure he can, you know, stay in the house after I die because it's his only place to live and blah, blah, blah. That's all great but you want to make the rules really clear. What are the conditions for his staying? Uh, oh, he has to pay the bills. Yes, the taxes and the insurance, but how about if the chimney collapses? How about if the septic doesn't work? What happens in those cases? And if he can't pay th those bills, is it nice and clear that at that point, because the thing, otherwise things are going to collapse, the house gets sold and the money gets divided up? Oftentimes in that situation, there'll actually be a provision that says that the personal representative will lease the house to that child and you put all these provisions in the lease so that if for some reason there's a violation you can evict them right there's actually a way to deal with that okay so probate avoidance if mary wants to do all of these things the next question is can she do them in a way that avoids going through the probate process why would she want to do that what is the point of probate probate as i mentioned a little earlier the point is to make sure that if you leave some if you have an asset you own when you die, that we can figure out who gets it. So if you own your house and you die, who gets it? And, and it, it, as I had mentioned, if, if you don't have a will, then a will has been written for you by the state. Those are the rules of intestacy. In this case, if you are married and you have children and you die, all assets go to the spouse. Until about four years ago, many people didn't realize that didn't, that wasn't the case. In that case, until fairly recently, half of the assets went to the kids and the other half went to the spouse. But now 100% goes to the spouse. The spouse is dead and you've got children, it just gets divided among the children. That's how the system, that's how the system works. But the point is, before that happens, we need to make sure that all the creditors get paid. That is why probate takes so long. Um, all assets that go through probate are subject to the claims of creditors. And creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the estate. Now, I know you're going to say, but I don't have any creditors. Well, that's great, but the only way we can be all sure of that is by waiting that year to see if a claim gets filed, which is the reason why probate assets don't get distributed to the final beneficiaries until a year and a day after, that, after the person's death, because that's how long creditors have to file their claims. So if you want to avoid that, the only way to avoid it is by avoiding probate. Incidentally, uh, personal property, like in the house, never ever causes there to be a probate. Stuff that's around the house, the kids just divide it up. It never happens. Um, cars often do. Car, the car is the one, in, when you're single, is the one asset that causes the most inadvertent probates. Because when you're married, it's not an issue. Because even if you own the car, if you die, there's a special state statute that says, that the spouse is the presumed joint owner. So the spouse can go to the registry with the, with, with the certificate of title, a death certificate and a marriage certificate, and the, and the registry will just transfer it. Not so if Frank is dead and now Mary dies and the car is in Mary's name, who gets it? Because if I'm the buyer of the car, I want to get your certificate of title. That's how I show I own the car, right? And, and oftentimes I'll tell people that and they'll say, but you know, this isn't a problem. The car isn't worth anything. It's only worth a couple thousand dollars. Even worse, because you still have to go through probate in order to get rid of the car that's only worth about what the cost of going through probate, right? So there isn't an easy answer to this. Uh, um, what I tell people, kind of the legal thing to do, it would be to put somebody on that car with you as a joint owner, probably the person that you wanted to give the car to, right? So that when you die, they become the sole owner. Uh, what people will also do uh, in many cases is simply sign the title ahead of time. Just keep that title around. Probably tell the person who has your power of attorney, right? 
if I get sick before I die, get rid of this car, <laughs> right? Get transfer it to whoever is supposed to be getting it, right? So there, those are the kind of ways to, ways to avoid um, probate. Wills do not avoid probate, as I mentioned. They simply determine how the assets get divided up at the end of probate. And you want to avoid it because of the cost and because of the one year delay. Uh, so a quick test. Here's Mary, she's got her home, she's got savings of $250,000, she's got an IRA or a 401k, which means presumably she's named a death beneficiary. She's got an annuity, presumably she's named a death beneficiary. She dies. Is there a probate necessary? Raise your hand if you think there is. Nobody. Raise your hand if you think there is not. Nobody. Oh, this is a scared audience. The answer is, it is necessary. She owns the house in her own name. She owns her bank account in her own name. Those assets are going to have to go through probate. So if she wants to avoid probate, how does she do that? Well, one possibility, as I mentioned with the car, is joint ownership. Uh, she, could own, she could do a deed. For, she could take the bank account and put all the kids' names on the bank account. Now, she might not want to do that because that means any one of those kids can go to the bank and take all the money. And if they've got a creditor, the creditor can then grab the money, right? But the point is, if you're not worried about that, this applies especially if you only have maybe one child and you really trust them and they're financially okay. That's a nice, simple way to deal with this. Um, POD or TOD, uh, in many bank account situations or with your funds at Fidelity or a lot of other places, you can actually name a person at death through a, through a TOD, transfer at death, or a POD, a pay on death clause. Um, you can't do that when you're going to your house. Regarding your house, what you would typically do is if, if instead of making your kids the joint owners of the house, which can be problematic, right, um, is that you would specify in your deed, you would give your kids a so-called remainder interest in the house, a remainder interest. You keep a life estate, that is, total control of the house until you die, which means you can live there, you can rent it, you're still obliged to pay the taxes and the insurance, all the things about ownership. But at the moment of your death, your interest evaporates and the kids become the sole owner. They are the owners of the remainder. They're actually called the remainder men. Um, if you do it that way, then um, first of all, you're avoiding probate. When you die, your, your interest evaporates. The kids become the instant sole owners, right? Secondly, and I'm going to mention this a little bit later on in a different context, if five years after you've done that transfer of the remainder interest to your house, that remainder interest is no longer countable or lienable if, if you want, need to qualify for mass health. At that point, mass health will put a lien on your, if, if you qualify for mass health, they'll put a lien on your life estate. But when you die, your life estate evaporates, as I said, and therefore so does the lien, leaving the kids owning the house lien free. Um, finally, kind of my personal favorite, last minute gifting. Last minute gifting, which nobody ever does. Um, and so I wanna talk about that for a while. So one thing, that Mary could do is she could simply, she's now, she's got a power of attorney, right? And she's given her child that she trusts totally, right? Peter, we're gonna say Peter, because he's the oldest, right? Um, the power to act on her behalf. What he could tell Peter to do, or what she could tell Peter to do is look, before I die, you know, I don't wanna give away my assets now because I need them, I might need them, right? But if I get sick, before I die, like just before I die, or a week before, whatever, take all my assets and give them away. Give them to the people that I had named in my will. You know, just give them away. And, and if she does that, then, then at, at, when she dies, there's no probate, right? Because she's given away all the assets. Now, there, there may be some concerns about doing that, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on, right? But basically, that's a nice, clean way to avoid probate, especially if you don't have much in assets. Right? Um, finally, if you're Mary and you've got a house and you don't want to put the house in other people's name because you want to keep control of it, uh, or you've got a bank account, you don't want to just put it in somebody else's name, but you want to avoid probate regarding those assets, then that's when people will create a revocable and amendable trust. You've probably all heard of those, right? The only reason, this is the, the, that particular trust is the solution to this problem of avoiding probate. What you do is you create a revocable and amendable trust. Mary would name herself as the trustee. A, the trustee in a, of a trust is the person who has legal control of the assets for the benefit of, of others, the beneficiaries. 
So she'd name herself as the trustee. The beneficiaries would be herself. You can be your own beneficiary, as well as the other kids. And she'd say it was revocable, meaning any asset that she put into the trust, she could always take out of the trust. That's what revocable means. Irrevocable means once it's in trust, you can't take them back. It would be amendable so that in the trust where she's got the rules about what happens after she dies, how the assets get divided up, she can change those rules anytime, right? And then she would transfer the, all of the property that she has that she wants to avoid probate with into that trust. But she would say in the trust that when she died, um, a new trustee would show up, presumably one of the kids or all of the kids, right? Um, and then at that point, the trustees would be authorized to immediately sell the house, divide up the money. And if she does that, then a, the day after she dies, all these assets can be distributed. Nothing's going through probate, because it's clear where everything goes, and all the creditor claims are avoided. So I'm just gonna mention as an aside on those creditor claims. So I got a client actually in Nantucket, who they retired to Nantucket, used to live outside of Boston, guys, parent, you know, father worked, both worked really hard, raised seven kids, right? Many of them went to college. Uh, everybody had student loans. Parent co parents co-signed on a boatload of student loans. Some of them got paid, you know, one became a doctor, one became a lawyer, they got paid back. There's an artist, there's a couple, they didn't get paid back. So now there's still $200,000, we'll say, in this point in student loans, once, once you count up the interest and all that jazz. And the parents are still paying, you know, and they're paying, you know, a fairly small amount every month. But, they, but they're concerned when they die, they'd like to leave they like to say that their house is going to get sold and the proceeds distributed. They don't have a lot of other assets. And they bought that house in Nantucket in the 80s for $200,000. And it being Nantucket, it's now worth a million seven, right? They have no mortgage, right? So they said, well, what can we do? And I said, well, you know, you just do this. You do a revocable and amendable trust and you hold the property in trust. And when the two of you die, the successor trustee can just sell the house. And all of the student loans, all of those that, all that, you've, that you guaranteed and that are therefore your personal liability, all get wiped out. Because the only, we, the only assets that can be chased following your death are the probate assets. So if there are no probate assets, you can't chase anything. So anyway, uh, that's, that's, that's probate avoidance. Estate tax minimization. So uh, once again, here are Mary's assets. And they add up to a million one. Um, Will she pay an estate tax when she dies? Yes, on a million one. Let me explain how that gets figured out. So historically, the, 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 she'll never pay a federal estate tax. She'll pay a Massachusetts estate tax. The estate tax was invented in Massachusetts and in most other places in the 20s. Um, and the idea was that it, it didn't seem fair that the, gov that, that, that the running of the government was only gonna get paid for by people just making a wage, you know, and, and whereas if you just happen to be the son or daughter of a person who accumulated a lot of money, you just get this bonus, you didn't have to pay anything. And so that's how they created the estate tax. And, and Massachusetts did. And the way they did it was they said, okay, we're gonna set an amount which we're gonna consider to be rich. And if you die owning that amount of assets or more than that, then you're gonna pay an estate tax. And the defin of, definition of rich then was, $40,000, if you had an estate of more than $40,000, you were rich. Which I remember being amazed at until I remembered that when my folks bought their house on French Hill in Marlboro in 1940, they paid $2,000. They financed it with a mortgage and they needed the tenant on the other side to help pay that mortgage for the $2,000, right? So 40,000 is 20 times $2,000. So imagine the value of your house right now in Holliston, $300,000, right? What's 20 times that, right? What, to, 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 that's three, uh, three million, six million dollars, right? Six million, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a big number now, right? So this was, that was really rich then, right? So, and so the way it worked is up to $40,000, you paid no estate tax, and then between 40,000 and 90,000, you paid eight tenths of 1%, and then between 90 and 160, this was a graduated system, so you paid the different rate on these different little pieces of money, right? Uh, and you keep on going down. So that by the time you got to a million, 
if you're if, on the money between a million forty thousand and a million five hundred forty thousand dollars, you're paying six point four percent. Now, using that chart, if you had a million dollars in an estate, a taxable estate of a million dollars, you owed thirty six thousand five hundred sixty dollars. If you had a million one hundred thousand dollars, which is the amount Mary has, right, million one hundred thousand dollars, you paid forty two thousand six hundred forty dollars. Now, why am I showing you this chart? Because it's still in effect. This is still in effect. This is the Massachusetts estate tax chart. Never changed. So why do you know in the back of your mind that there's this million dollar figure that you don't have to pay any estate tax? The reason for that is uh, later, I think first time in the 50s, real estate prices went up, right? And they kept going up. And so it started becoming that if you owned a house when you died, you paid an estate tax because, because it was worth, you get up to that 40,000 figure. And so people you know, went to their legislators and said, this doesn't seem right. This wasn't the concept, right? And so the legislature at that point could have changed this chart, but they didn't. That would have been too complicated. Instead, they did the easy thing. They changed the magic number. And they said, well, we'll leave the chart in effect, but instead of if you, don't have, if you have a estate of $40,000, you don't pay an estate tax, we're going to increase that number to $100,000. And then later it went to, I think, three, and then 500, and then $600,000. These happened during my lifetime. That's how old I am. And then finally, about 20 years ago, it went to a million. So if you have an estate of a million dollars or less, you don't pay an estate tax. Which then leads to the question, well, what if you have a million and one dollars? Then what happens, right? Well, in some states, and I often use the example of Rhode Island, Rhode Island until about three years ago, no longer the case, but until about three years ago, their estate tax was referred to as a cliff tax. They had done the same thing. They had adopted a chart, and then over time, the magic the line went up. But, the, but their rule was, if you cross the line, you fell off the cliff. So if, if their magic number at the end was $650,000. If you had an estate of $650,000 or less, you paid no estate tax. If you were a dollar over, you fell off the cliff and you owed all the money that you owed under the chart, which was $30,000, $40,000, right? Massachusetts did it differently, but same concept. Massachusetts said, what we're going to do is we're going to set up an alternate tax calculation. And if you have an estate that's worth more than a million dollars, you calculate your tax two ways, and you have to pay the lower of the two. The first way is the chart. The second way is take all of the money over a million dollars and take 40% of that. It's a 40% tax. And figure it out that way. And then pay the lower number. So in Mary's case, right, if you figure it out this way, 40% of all the dollars over a million, remember she has a million one hundred thousand dollars, so 40% of a hundred thousand dollars is forty thousand dollars. If you calculate it this way, using the chart, she owes forty two thousand six hundred forty, just a little bit more. Therefore, if Mary's estate is a million one, she owes forty thousand dollars, right? Now, as you could see from those numbers, pretty soon, those two lines cross. The 40% of all the dollars over a million soon exceeds the chart. Because at 40% at, at of, of the money over, um, whoops, sorry. At 40% of the money over, over a million, you're already at $40,000 when you get to a million, right? Whereas on the chart, you're at, thir at 42,640. But remember, the rate on that money that you're paying is only 6%, right? Whereas, using the other system, you're paying 40%, 40 cents on every dollar. The lines cross at about $1,120,000. And after that, you just revert to this chart. Once again, this is the chart that is in effect right now. So the question, if you're Mary, then is, so I've got this estate that's worth $1,100,000, and I'm going to pay 40% of that last $100,000 in estate tax. That's, a, that's a huge. How can I get rid of that, right? Um, well, one answer is to give it away. You just can give it away, right? Once, once again, if Mary gave all of her assets away before she died, then her estate tax would be zero because her estate would be zero on the day of her death, even if she gave it away the day before she died. Um, if, and I'm going to give you some more examples. Once again, Massachusetts has no estate tax. Now, I know you're thinking 
but wait a minute, there's this number, there's this 15,000. If I give away more than $15,000 in a year, some bad thing's going to happen. Now, if I asked you, you couldn't tell me what that bad thing is. I guarantee it. And the reason is no bad thing happens. The reason why you know that number is this. On the federal level, on the federal level, there is a gift tax. And it's part of the combined federal gift and estate tax system. And the way that system works is that if you die today, leaving an estate of $11.4 million or more, you're going to pay an estate tax. And it's a very, it starts very high. It starts between 30 and 40 percent on your first dollar, over $11.4 million. Because as far as the government is concerned, at that point, you're pretty rich, right? But then the federal government did something to try to block this idea of just giving it all away before you died. So they said, if you give it away before you die, right, then we're going to make you, at the time of your death, add back in the money that you gave away before you died. And we're going to tax the whole thing, what you have when you die plus what you gave away, right? Except, as to gifts that you give before you die, there are two exclusions. The first one, everybody knows. You can't give, if you give away less than a particular amount, which used to be $10,000 per year per person, and over time that's gone up with inflation, and it's now $15,000 per year per person. If you give away less than that amount, well, that's excluded from all of this. Everybody knows that one. Nobody knows the second one. In addition to that, if you give away more than that amount per person per year, you, you also have an annual, you, excuse me, you have a lifetime giving exclusion beyond that of $11.4 million dollars equal to the amount that you would have, you would have, that would have made you kick in if, if you had actually died owning $11.4 million. So in other words, if, if Mary were to give away today uh, $100,000, um, the first $15,000 of that would have been excluded under the first exclusion, $15,000 per year. The other $85,000 is excluded under her lifetime exclusion. The only thing that she's supposed to do in that case is file a gift tax return. And the reason for filing the gift tax return is so that she can tell the federal government, the guy in the back room that keeps tra track of all these things, that she, took, that she, spent, that she gave away this extra $85,000, which will then get subtracted from the $11.4 million she can leave when she dies, so that now she can only leave $11.4 million minus $85,000. Right? See the concept? The net effect is this whole gift tax thing just is totally irrelevant in just about all cases. You can give away, Mary can give away all of the money that she has before she dies, completely avoid the estate tax. There is only one place where that number is relevant. We're going to talk about that. First of all, it's not relevant in this case. Suppose Mary's assets were a million three. She, well, she had assets of a million three, and she told her son, Peter, before I die, give away $100,000. And he did. So that, it be, so that instead of her assets being a million three when she died, on which she would have owed an estate tax of $55,440, there were a million two. And now she only owes an estate tax of $49,040. That works all fine. She saves that money, 6.4% of, of $100,000, $6,400. The only thing she can't give, do is give a chunk of money away in order to get herself below that magic million so that she gets to say, even though I have a million dollar estate, I don't pay any estate tax, right? Because if she gives away, say that she gave away, say Mary has that estate of a million one, and the day before she dies, she gives away $115,000. Well, for, a, for Massachusetts estate tax purposes, they would say, the first 15,000 that you gave was fine. But that other 100,000, we're going to add back into your estate for purposes of determining whether you have to file an estate tax return and for purposes of, of determining whether or not you're entitled to the alternative tax, that 40% of all the dollars over a, over a, um, over a million. And in, so in that case, if she made that gift as a result of it, she's still going to end up paying an estate tax. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, if she made that gift, her total assets would be 
a million one hundred thousand dollars minus one hundred fifteen thousand dollars, she'll have to pay a tax on a million dollars using the chart. She will not have been able to escape the escape the chart. She will have shrunk her total estate from a million one to a million, so she's only going to pay on that chart on that million, but she won't have totally escaped. The only way that she can escape while still keeping that million dollars is by making gifts in, in an amount that is less than $15,000 per person per year. So if she told Peter, before I die, before I die, if my assets are, whatever my assets are, say they're a million one, I want you to make sure that you've given away all of the money that gets me down to a million, but you have to give it away in chunks of $15,000 or less. So for example, if I've got a million one, find seven people, my kids, their kids, my kids' spouses, find seven people to whom you can write a $15,000 check. And if you do that the day before I die, thereby reducing my assets below a million dollars, when I die, I'm not going to pay any estate tax. And the effect of writing those checks is that really Mary has written checks for only 60 cents on the dollar and the government's paying the other 40. Because she's a, by writing those checks for a million, she's avoiding paying $40,000 in estate tax. See how that works? So that's the concept. Uh, finally, gifts to charity. Gifts to charity are subtracted from the taxable estate. So if she gives money, she says in her will, any money that I have over a million dollars, I'm going to give to the church, or I'm going to give to the hospital, or I'm going to give to somebody. If, if that's what's in the will, or in her trust, or whatever, and therefore her taxable estate drops to a million dollars, she ends up paying no estate tax. Um, finally, one other thing. Suppose now Mary is 80 years old instead of 65. Suddenly she has a new problem. She's really worried, uh, and she has the same assets. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. She's worried about asset protection. She says to herself, oh my God, now I'm 80. What happens if I end up having to go to a nursing home? Right? I've got all this money. What's going to happen? Nothing, is, nothing good is going to happen. She's right about that. Um, because if she goes to a nursing home and she's there for more than 100 days, Medicare is going to stop paying. And if she's paying privately, she's going to be paying around $14,000 a month. You'll recall that her income was $2,000 a month from Social Security, which means her burn rate, the rate at which her other money is going to have to get used up, is going to be about $12,000 a month or $144,000 a year. That's not good. Now, if Mary qualifies for Mass Health, then from the day she qualifies for Mass Health, she keeps paying her $2,000 a month to the nursing home, but Mass Health pays all the rest, right? So her burn rate goes way down, right? However, and she can qualify for Mass Health. She can always qualify for Mass Health. Um, she can qualify, first of all, because her home, for purposes of qualifying, is not a countable asset, as long as she says in the application that she intends to return home, even if there's no chance that she can really return home. Um, the rest of her money, has to, she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. She can't give it away at this point because of the famous five-year look-back period. Where all you, I won't even gonna go there, you all know that number. Right? What she can do, though, with those assets, she can keep the house, she can use some of the money to buy an annuity, a specific kind of annuity, an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her actuarial life expectancy. If Mary is 85, at that point her life expectancy is about six years, seven years. She can buy an annuity. That's not going to use up all of her money, right? but it's going to use up a chunk. She can take the rest and transfer it to something called a D4C pooled trust. I've talked about these in previous seminars, so I, I'm not going to get into detail with them, but basically the way they work, they're all run by nonprofits that run for the benefit of elderly and disabled people. If the money goes to them, they manage the money and pool it with all the other money they have, that's why they're called pool trusts, and then this, these monies can be used to supplement Mary's care for the rest of her life. Anything that she wants, any improvement that she wants to her, to her nursing home, or trips, or better food, or clothes, any number of things. Now when she dies, the remaining amount of money in that D4C pool trust is going to be subject to the ma a mass health lien. Same thing with the house, same thing with any extra annuity payments. But look, say Mary um, 
get, gets, is, is applying for MassHealth. The moment Mary qualifies for MassHealth, the nursing home rate for her bed in her nursing home, the same bed, same nursing home, is going to drop from about $14,000 a month to about $7,000 a month. These rates vary by nursing home and, a term, and by level of, uh, of sickness, but that's about the right number. So say it's $7,000. And remember, Mary's income is going to be going to the nursing home. All of her income has to go to the nursing home. MassHealth pays the rest. And then MassHealth has a lien after Mary dies to recover whatever they paid. So say Mary buys an annuity that's going to pay her $5,000 a month, right? And remember that annuity, and so $5,000 a month is about $60,000 a year. So if she spends $300,000 on an annuity, $300,000 divided by 60 is going to be five years. That would buy her five years worth of, of, uh, of uh, $5,000 a month payments. She buys that annuity now, and then qualifies for mass health. So now because she's on the mass health rate, the nursing home cost goes down to $7,000 a month. Her income, because of the annuity, has just gone up to $7,000 a month, which means once she's on MassHealth, no lien starts accruing because MassHealth isn't paying any money. She's on MassHealth, but she's paying the nursing home the amount that the nursing home needs at the MassHealth rate. See how this works? As a result of that, when Mary dies, there's going to be no lien on her other assets. The D4C money, all safe. The house, all safe. Any remaining payments on that annuity after she dies, assuming that she dies during that period of the, of the term of the annuity, all safe. So the point is, I want Mary and you to remember, you can always qualify for mass health, even if you haven't done this advanced planning. However, this still does result in a cost. There's still a cost of $5,000 a month to Mary's assets, right? Um, and so for people who want to avoid that, the only way to do that, if you're single, is to get married, of course, that's the easy way, because then if you need nursing home care, you can just shift it to your husband or your wife, but nobody ever wants to do that. So <clears throat> the only way to deal with it is to give all your assets, so give, the, give away the assets that you want to protect and wait five years. That's the famous five-year look-back period. The ideal person to give it to, somebody you really trust, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. The ideal is when you have one child and you really trust them, and they're going to be getting the assets anyway, you give it to them ahead of time. You avoid the estate tax, and five years after you've done that, the assets are protected. In Mary's case, um, once again, she could just give it away to any one of the kids. The alternative in regarding the house, she wouldn't just give them the house, deed them the house. She would do what I said earlier. She'd give them a remainder interest in the house and keep a life estate. Because five years after she's done that, that remainder interest is safe. As I mentioned, if she then needs to qualify for Mass Health, Mass Health will lean the life estate. But when she dies, the life estate will go away, and therefore the lien, and so it'll all be safe. That's the house. Um, and I, so I talked about that. Oh, no, and the additional thing, as I mentioned, too, by structuring things that way, as far as the house is concerned, when she dies, the so-called tax basis of the house will jump to the date of death value. So when the kids sell the house, it's lien-free, and it's also capital gains tax-free. They'll pay no capital gains tax. Um, the minuses of doing it this way uh, are if you've transferred the house out or the other assets and the kids and, and maybe one of the kids doesn't want to give their interest back well now you have a problem right um, and for folks who are worried about that or worried about protecting those assets because of the kids problems that's the one and only time where you do an irrevocable trust you'd probably name your most trusted child as the trustee because you want the child to be the trustee who's going to give give you the assets back and the way that he'll do that or she is there'll be a provision in the trust that'll say that distributions from the trust can go back to the kids or to any one of the kids. Mary can't be the beneficiary. So the money would go or the, to the kids and then the kids would turn around and use it for the mother's benefit. That's the way the irrevocable trust works. Uh, there are some specific provisions that you wanna make sure they're in there. Mary can't be the trustee of that trust if it needs one, need to be one of the kids, but she can maintain the power to dump that trustee if she doesn't think the trustee is doing a good job and appoint somebody else. Um, the distributions in this case would be to the kids, so they'd have to turn around and, 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 and give it back to her. There's no way once the money's in this irrevocable trust, she can get it back, force it to come back. It has to be irrevocable. She has to have given up her rights to make that happen. Uh, so in Mary's case, that's what she would do. If you've got any questions, because I talk too fast and you want to hear this again, right? Uh, first of all, thank you to Holliston Cable, which replays these, and I really appreciate that. Um, secondly, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. You can find it there. 
Um, and remember the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. So if you're not worried about this, that's okay, right? If you are worried about it, you should talk to your lawyer about it because every one of your problems has a solution. Thank you very much. Any questions? If not, thank you very much. I appreciate the attention and we'll see you in the fall. Thank you. Thank you.